Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining tonight's live webcast, the ABCDs of Evaluating Keratoconus and Progression, brought to you by Oculus. Before we get started, I would like to point out that you have a text box on your GoToWebinar control panel where you can type in questions. Feel free to send in your questions during the presentation or immediately after the presentation, and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of tonight's session. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Michael Bellin. Dr. Bellin is a professor of ophthalmology and vision science at the University of Arizona, Tucson. Dr. Bellin has published several studies and articles in ophthalmology journals on corneal pathology and refractive surgery. The American Academy of Ophthalmology has recognized Dr. Bellin's contributions and over the years has awarded him the American Academy of Ophthalmology's Honor Award, Senior Honor Award, and Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Bellin has also been a valued consultant for Oculus, and without him, we wouldn't have valuable tools such as the Bellin Ambrosia software or the more recent ABCD Keratoconus staging and progression software. So needless to say, it's a pleasure. And without any more delay, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Bellin. Thank you. So what we're going to do this evening is, in a hopefully an orderly and logical progression, get to the ABCD progression dis dis display. We're really going to divide this up into three different sections. I always start a little bit with a background or the derivation of the bad display because that was really the takeoff point, which, which I'll explain for the ABCD classification or staging, which then led to the progression display. So I want to go a little bit about the derivation of the bad display. I think many of you are familiar with the bad display. And the bad display uses something that we call an enhanced reference surface. Now, the way elevation is normally shown, it's shown against a reference surface. And the most commonly used reference surface is a best fit sphere. And that's what you see here. And this is a, a schematic of, let's say, an ectatic cornea. Now, eyes of keratoconus, as we know, have an ectatic region. And as we get closer to the periphery, the shape more normalizes. So if you have a best fit shape to, a, again, the schematic, you'll see that what we're looking for is that area that sticks above the yellow or the best fit sphere. And we call that a positive island of elevation. But we would really like to maximize our ability to visualize that pathology. So while this is a best fit sphere, what we really would like somehow is to get a reference shape that more closely looks like this, because this would allow that ectatic or pathologic region to be much more visible. In other words, a much greater elevation off the reference surface. And what we've done in the bad display is we've taken the standard way we compute a best fit sphere is that we utilize all the data within an eight millimeter zone. And what we've done to develop this, what we call the enhanced reference surface, is we've taken that same eight millimeter zone, but we've created what we call an exclusion zone. And the exclusion zone is what we see in red here. It's an area, and it actually is variable between three and four millimeters. It's a complicated formula how that's done, but just figure it as, as a small area surrounding the thinnest point on the cornea. And here in this example, we say it's 3.5, but they said it fluctuates based on a formula that we have between three and four. But what we do with the enhanced reference surface is we exclude that area in red. So again, in this example, we're excluding a 3.5 millimeter optical zone surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea, but we're looking at all the other data. And what that does, it effectively removes the bulk of the ectatic region and normalizes the reference surface. So what it does, if you look at the upper left, that's utilizing a standard best fit sphere. And the upper right is use, utilizing that enhanced reference surface. And what you can see again is that the ectatic region becomes more prominent, greater elevation, easier to see when we use the enhanced reference surface. Now, normalize don't normally have an ectatic region. And when we exclude that same zone in a normal eye, there is very little change in going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced ref reference surface. 
And if we look at an eye here, this is actually back elevation, but if you look at the left, I don't know if my pointer will work on the screen. Yeah, it does. If you look here, there's a very subtle area here that what we call a positive ion with elevation. Now this is again, utilizing the standard reference surface. So this dotted line here represents the pupil. The whole map is nine millimeters, but this is the eight millimeter zone. So we're using everything within this eight millimeter zone to compute the reference surface. Compare this difficult to see very early island of elevation to this map that now utilizes the enhanced reference surface. Again, the same eight millimeter zone, but we're using all the data inside that minus this exclusion zone here. And notice what happens to that difficult to see island of elevation. It becomes much easier to see. Again, it accentuates the pathology. And that's, again, the purpose of that enhanced reference surface. Here's another example looking at both the anterior elevation and the posterior elevation. Again, you'll notice using the standard reference surface, easy to see, but notice how much more prominent and more elevated it is against the enhanced reference surface. And again, I don't think anyone would miss the posterior elevation here, but notice again, we go from an elevation of 60 to 87. Again, the enhanced reference surface further accentuates the pathology. Just as important is that we don't create false positives. In other words, yes, we accentuate the pathology in ectatic. We don't want to make sure we create false positives and normalize. And when we do that same manipulation and normalize, this is the standard reference surface. This is the enhanced. You'll notice there's almost no difference. And the same thing here. This is the standard, and this is the enhanced. And again, you'll notice there's almost no difference in normalized going from the standard reference surface to the enhanced. When we look at a large database, the difference in elevation in going from the standard reference surface to the enhanced reference surface turned out to be highly statistically significant for actually separating normalized from ectatic eyes. And if you look here, normalize the elevation change, the maximal elevation change in normalized was less than a two micron difference while on the, at the anterior surface, while in keratoconic eyes, it was over a 20 micron difference. And again, highly statistically significant, even more so on the posterior surface, where the change going from the standard reference surface to the enhanced reference surface was less than three microns. In the keratoconic eyes, it was roughly 40 and above microns. So again, highly statistically significant. So if we look at the elevation difference going from normal to enhanced reference surface, that was highly statistically significant in separating normal from keratoconic eyes. And graphically, it's easy to see that, again, green is normal, red is keratoconic eyes. So you can see this is at the apex. This is the maximum amount. This is the posterior surface at the apex, and that's the maximal elevation difference. And again, you can see there's a huge difference in how a keratoconic eye behaves and how a normal eye behaves. So that is basically the left part of the Bell and Ambrosia display. And again, it uses that elevation difference going from a standard to enhanced reference surface. The other side of the Bell and Ambrosia display, I won't go over tonight because it's not relevant to the ABCD, but those are pachymetric parameters. I'll just give you one example to show you the value of the pachymetric as opposed to just looking at a single number. So this is actually the work done by Renato Ambrosia, but this is his pachymetric progression graphs. This is the, the upper one is the corneal thickness spatial profile. The lower one is the percent thickness increase. They actually show you the same thing. They're just different ways of showing, representing it. And I always find that the lower one, the PTI, is much, much easier to interpret. So what this is, it shows you the rate of change in corneal thickness going from the thinnest point to the periphery. 
Now, normal eyes have a certain normal progression from the center, which is the thinnest, to the periphery. Keratoconic eyes actually change more rapidly. Now, that sounds kind of not intuitive to think it thickens more rapidly, but if I just give you the, the inverse, if you start in the periphery and go to the thinnest point, it thins more quickly than a normal eye will. And the value of that is you can see up here in the, in the upper, these are two corneas that have identical central thickness readings. So if all you have was an ultrasonic pachymeter, you would get the same reading. But if you look at the upper left eye and you look down at this, the PTI graph, notice that red tracing is right in the middle. So in other words, it's a completely normal pachymetric progression. This is a 95% confidence interval, the upper and lower. The middle is actually the, the complete mean. And notice this eye, it's exactly down the normal line. This eye on the upper right, which has the same ultrasonic reading, notice the tracing, it's way below. It's outside the normal range because it's a more rapid change. This eye is indicative of an ectatic pathology. This eye is normal. Not talking about keratoconus, but if you have eyes with corneal edema, they tend to thicken more in the, in the center than the periphery, and you get a loss of, of change. And that's what you see here by a flattening of the PTI graphs. So this is an eye indicative of endothelial de decompensation. De and again, this isn't really a talk about the BAD, but the BAD uses a regression analysis on nine different parameters to basically give you a variation from normal. And I think most of us who use the BAD display know it, that we show nine different parameters. Actually, we show more than that, but only nine are in the regression analysis. We color code them if you want them color coded where if it's 1.6 standard deviation outside the norm, they turn yellow. If it's 2.6, they turn red. But those are just the individual parameters. The only parameter that has statistical validity is the overall reading, what we call the final D reading. So again, don't overread any of the individual parameters. It's really the final D that has the statistical validity in separating normal from ab abnormal. And I always use glaucoma as an example. If someone comes in your office with a pressure of 22, that, that would be outside of 1.6 standard deviations outside the norm. But if they have a cup to disc of 0.1, a normal visual field, a normal nerve fiber, and no family history, then they're, they're normal, even though you may have one single parameter that's outside that, quote, normal range. But again, this is what the, the current Bell and Ambrosia display looks like. And again, you'll notice that many different parameters, we give you the standard deviations and we will color code them for you. But I really wanted to, for tonight, we're concentrating on the left side, which is really what you'll see how we progressed from the Bell and Ambrosia display to the ABCD classification, and then later to the progression dis dis display. People ask me, so I'm gonna put this in what my general guidelines are. I'm gonna end, end with a kind of a new thing on, on the bad display. And what I do in a practice sometimes is not validated by, by data, it's just what my practice is, but I rarely do refractive surgery on patients less than 21 unless it's needed for occupational needs. Very different outside the US where it's very common to do refractive surgery on younger patients. I don't do LASIK, or I, uh, you never say never, but in general, with a thinnest pachymetry below 495, and that's a thinnest reading, not an ap apical reading. There is absolutely no data su to support this. It's just what my practice is. And I've not used an ultrasound pachymetry in probably eight, eight years. I completely use the thinnest reading off the Pene Pene cam. I use a minimal 300 micron residual bed, and that's based on the thinnest pachymetry. And it used to be based on when I used an intralace on my femtosecond plus two standard deviations. The Alcon wavelet, at least in when we've done some comparison med measurements, has a much tighter standard deviation. So on the Alcon unit, I just use the setting on, on, on the Al Al Alcon. I use different limits based on the age of the patient. Obviously, I'm more conservative on the younger patients. And this is kind of something I showed for a, a long period of time. And that is that my limits change as the patient gets older and older. And we ended up doing some work in 
Renato has published some data on something called the TBI, and TBI has an age factor. So what, what I did is I took his computation and I basically kept everything constant in a number of different images and just varied age. And what I found is that age is a linear factor in basically risk. And this graph mimicked almost exactly what I did back here clinically. So what I've come up with is actually an age-adjusted final D. And this is yet to be published and hopefully it's gonna be incorporated uh, in the next iteration of the BAD. But basically you have a, if your patient is less than 30 years, you add 0 0.05 to each year and we stop at age 18. And after above 31, you decrease by 0 0.05. So in other words, if you had a patient who was, let's say, 21, and the final D was 1.6, effectively an age-adjusted final D would be 2.05. So effectively, it removes the fact, if we go back here, it removes the fact that you have a floating number based on the patient age and gives you an age-adjusted. And hopefully, as I said, this will be uh, added as a next iter iteration on, on the bad display. So I'm gonna skip by this. That was kind of just a quick overview, and you'll see why I want to go over that when we get now into the ABCD grading or staging. So now it's been almost three, actually it's been now for three years since there was a major publication called the Global Consensus on Ectatic Disease, Keratoconus and Ectatic Disease. And this was a published paper in the journal Cornea by the four major multinational cornea societies, the Cornea Society, Eucornea, Asia Cornea, and Pan Cornea. And one of the major conclusions was that we had no effective way to grade keratoconus that was, that was current, and we had no way to determine when and if true progression occurs. And the reason for that is people are still using something that is 70 years old, and that's amzacrumac. And amzacrumac is about as outdated of a staging system as you can get. And many of you have heard me say this before, I know no other field of medicine that anyone is using a 70-year-old staging system. Can you imagine if you went to your oncologist and they were grading you based on something from the 1940s, you would walk out of the office. But people still routinely utilize amzacrumac and lots of limitations on amzaprumac. And one is it was based on a keratometer and an optical pachymeter. So it predates any modern, actually any imaging. It was, again, based on optical pachymetry and a keratometer. So here's an example. This is a cornea that actually, if you actually put the cursor here in an active display, you would get a finish point of 499. But again, amzaprumac uses a optical, in this case, ultrasonic pachymetra, we would get a reading of 519 or 520. So it doesn't utilize thinnest point. But most importantly, the real limitation of amzacrumac is it completely ignores the posterior cornea. The reason for that is, again, in the 1940s, we had no way to measure the posterior cornea. But additionally, in the 1940s, we really only had two treatments, contact lenses and penetrating keratoplasty. And the only time you would intervene other than spectacles is when the per person had inadequate visual acuity, which meant they had changes on the anterior surface. We really didn't have the modalities that we have now that warrant us to intervene as early as pos possible. So again, this is an example, for those who you are familiar with the bell ambrosia, of moderately advanced keratoconus, huge posterior ectasia, but an absolutely normal anterior surface. This is not recognized at all in amsacrumac. So what we needed, and again, this was stated in that global consensus, we need a classification or staging that recognizes all the anatomical layers. So that means the anterior surface, the posterior surface, corneal thickness. We needed to have parameters that were relatively simple and I put here platform independent, and that really means as long as you can have any tomographic device. Obviously, you can't do this on a placido system because placidos don't measure the posterior surface. 
and the information should be relatively easy to convey. And the reason for that is we now have a d number of modalities that weren't available in the 1940s, and the biggest one on this list really is cross-linking. Cross we don't want to wait till someone has major anterior changes and decreased vision before we say, okay, we now can stabilize your disease. That's waiting till they've had loss of vision. We want something that can identify patients as early as possible. And again, Amzacrumac completely ignores early disease, completely ignores the posterior surface. So what we did is, and that's now you'll understand why I started off with the bad display. We know the bad display, which is we show up here in schematic here, uses, again, an enhanced reference surface that takes the eight millimeter zone, but excludes a three to four millimeter zone. And it turns out that that three to four millimeter, that formula that computes what, what, what is between three and four, it almost always defaults to three millimeters on an eye that has true keratoconus. So that enhanced reference surface works because when we exclude this red area here, we're excluding, uh, we exclude the bulk of the ectatic region. So I want to say it again. The enhanced reference surface works because when we take that zone surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea and we remove it from the reference surface, we effectively remove the bulk of the ectatic region. Well, in the bad display, we want to do that because we want to normalize the reference surface. By normalizing the reference surface, we cause greater elevation change in the ectatic region. But if we now want to kind of have a descriptor of the cone, we already know that that three millimeter zone that we've excluded has removed the bulk of the ectatic region. So as opposed to removing the exclusion zone, we're going to examine that exclusion zone since again, it represents the bulk of the ectatic region. So what we've done is we said, let's look at that three millimeter zone surrounding the thinnest point of the, on the cornea. And we'll look at both the anterior surface and the posterior surface. Well, the posterior surface, if we continue to use diopters, becomes something that's not really intuitive. We're all kind of used to looking at diopters on the anterior surface. And if I tell you it's a 44 diopter cornea, you kind of intuitively know what I'm talking about. But the posterior cornea is a low power minus lens. And if I tell you the posterior cornea is minus seven diopters, I can't, it doesn't convey in any intuitive fashion. So what really is a better way to describe surfaces than diopters is radius of curvature for a number of reasons. One is it's independent of the index of refraction. It's independent of whether you go from an air cornea interface or a cornea aqueous interface. Now, optometry who deals with contact lenses is familiar with radius of curvature, we are, uh, most ophthalmologists are less familiar. There's no difference other than it's actually a, a better me mechanical measurement because it's again, independent of radius of curve, independence of index of refraction. So we looked at the anterior radius of curvature surrounding the thinnest point in the three millimeter zone. We looked at the posterior radius of curvature, again, three millimeter zone surrounding the thinnest point, and then just the actual corneal thickness, and you don't need to know any of this, but we looked at a large database and came up with the mean, medium, standard deviation, and what the range was. That doesn't really enter into the ABCD. We then came and said, okay, let's look at Amsla Crumac. And if Amsla Crumac, instead of using diopters, use radius of curvature, what would stage one to four be in radius of curvature? And we looked at that and determined what the standard deviation would be. And we applied that across the board in standard deviations for both the anterior, the posterior, and corneal thickness. One other limitation of AMSA Crumac, if you think about it, is everyone has, quote, stage one keratoconus. If you look at what AMSA Crumac, and I'm gonna have to back up a whole lot, stage one is almost, almost all the audience here has a corneal radius of less than 48, myopia astigmatism is less than five, and no corneal opacities. We all have stage one disease, which obviously makes no sense. 
So we added stage zero to more represent a more normal cornea. So let me kind of go over this again. A stands for the anterior radius of curvature taken from the three millimeter zone at the thinnest point. B is back or posterior. C is the corneal thinnest point. And D is distance visual acuity. Now, obviously, the Pentacam doesn't measure visual acuity, so that's an operator entered number. And again, we have stage zero, one, two, three, and four. Here we show what the diopters are, but really, again, we'll only do a radius of curvature in the future. These are just the numbers basically from Amsler Krumak. Sounds confusing, and I originally said this is going to be relatively simple, and that's because really this is all done automatically for you. And it is currently the staging or classification system is currently part of the topometric keratoconus staging display and is over here. I'll just show you that as a blow up. So it really gives you three different bits of information. The actual description of the cornea is shown here, these numbers. So the anterior radius of curvature here is 7.6. The posterior radius of curvature is 4.82. The thinnest pachymetry is 381. And the distance visual acuity, which the operator you have to enter is 2020. The classification is shown here. Again, realize a classification by definition groups. So in other words, let's take weight. Everyone who weighs between 180 and 200 pounds is in one group. That doesn't mean the person who's 181 and 199 are the same. It's just grouping. So this is the grouping. And again, this is a normal anterior surface, A0, a prominent posterior ectasia, B4, moderately thin cornea, C3, but normal distance because the anterior surface is normal, so D0. Graphically, you can see, and the, the graphical display gives you more information than just the actual classification down here, because you can see graphically that this is a very normal anterior surface. The posterior surface is actually greater than, than stage four, but you can say like distance visual acuity here, we're almost to one here. This is slightly above three, but you can get a better feel. So this again will tell you the example again, if someone is 181, someone is 199 pounds, they may be in the same grouping, but they're clearly different. This will actually show you where, where they fall in that grouping. So let's look at a couple examples. Here is a normalized, this is a four macro factor. Here is the topometric keratoconus staging with this part blown up. And you can see again, everything is completely normal. Everything is zero across the board. This is a very early ectatic change. You can see here an early, an early island here, a more prominent island here. And you can see again, this is a good example of why it's good to look at the graphs, not just this classification. So here you see A1, and you can see it's actually a little past one, but you see B0. Why is it B0 when I see an ectasia? Well, if you look at it, it's 0 0.9. In other words, it's just below a stage one. Normal corneal thickness, C0. Slight decreased visual acuity, D, D1. Here's more moderately advanced. You can see again, the obvious island here, a really prominent posterior ectasia here. And again, you can see A2, it's really 2.8, it's almost a three. B4, actually way outside the range. C1, only moderately thin, significant loss of visual acuity, again, because the anterior surface is, is, is affected. And here is advanced keratoconus. I don't think we need a staging system or anything to pick this up, but again, you can see it's greater than four on both the anterior and posterior surface. Uh, C2 is only moderately thinned and significant decrease in visual acuity. So again, this describes exactly what the surface is. This gives you the grouping, and this shows you kind of where in the grouping you are. Hopefully that makes sense. But the real reason we developed the ABCD staging and classification was to ultimately utilize it to help us to determine when and if we have true progression of disease. And 
in the past, there's been many parameters people have utilized in studies. The most common is KMAX, and KMAX for many years has been recognized as actually a very poor determinant both of progression and also of efficacy of treatment, though it's the most commonly used. And you can see here a number of different parameters people have, have utilized. What you'll notice about almost all of them, spherical power, spherical component, K-max, K-max, K-mean, not pachymetry, uh, back optics, which makes no sense of a contact lens increase. If you look at all these, all these, they're all anterior parameters, except for pachymetry. Every single one here is an anterior parameter, which means you can never tell whether someone has really early disease and if it's progressing, because all these parameters rely already on changes on the anterior surface. So I, I kind of, I'm a car person. This is kind of what we've done in the past. This is called an idiot light. It lets us know when basically you've developed a problem. And that's kind of what all those parameters are. Those parameters are late parameters. It tells you you already had changes on, on the anterior sur surface. This is what we need. We need a way to monitor changes so that you can pick changes up before you actually do, in this case, damage to an engine, in our case, before you actually lose vision. So, and again, the real reason for this is cross-linking. Because the goal of cross-linking should not be stabilization after you've lost vision. It should be the prevention of loss of vision. So we need a way to intervene early enough before we have loss of vision. The problem is, is we need a way to determine when and if true progression occurs. We don't wanna be treating you know, people who don't require treatment. I, I kinda of go saying that one of the biggest problems now with cross-linking is we're treating too many people who don't need to be treated and too few people who should be treated. So what we had to do is we had to determine the noise level for each of these parameters. In other words, if we're going to use the ABCD, and actually just really, it's not really D, the ABC parameters to determine when and if we have change, we have to know what the normal noise level is of that measurement. Now, we've actually published noise levels on thinnest point, but the A and B, which is again, the anterior radius of curvature taken from the three millimeter zone from a th surrounding the thinnest point, both on the anterior and posterior, are new parameters, and we did not have noise levels for those parameters. We also decided it was important to determine noise levels from two different populations, both a normal population and an abnormal pop population. And the reason for that, this is anyone knows, is from young, young Frankenstein. The reason for that is if you have an older patient with clinically evident keratoconus, the noise levels of those measurements are going to more closely mimic a keratoconic database. But if you have a young patient with very early subclinical disease, the noise levels are more likely to be closer to what a normal population noise level would be. Additionally, that younger patient, you're probably less willing to observe over time because you know young patients can un undergo change very rap rapidly. So again, if you have 40-year-old patient with moderately advanced keratoconus, a long history of keratoconus, those measurements, again, are going to be more closely related to the noise levels of a keratoconic population. And again, you're probably more willing to observe that to see if, if and when true change occurs. But that young, very early subclinical, which looks more normal, the noise levels are going to more closely mimic a normal pop population. So what we did is we determined the noise levels of these three parameters, the anterior rays of curvature, the posterior rays of curvature, and corneal thick thickness, both on a keratoconic population and on a normal population. And we determined both an 80% and a 95% one-tail confidence interval. So a one-tail confidence interval means we're only interested in one-sided, and that is we're only interested if, if the cornea steepens, or if it thins. So that's called a, a one-tail confidence interval. And if you look at the numbers, it's not important what the numbers are, but it's exactly what you would think. In other words, let's look at the anterior radius of curvature. The 95% confidence interval for a keratoconic kind of population is much higher than, than a normal population. You can see again the posterior surface, but in general, 
that's always the case. Your keratoconic population is noisier than your normal population. So we computed, as I said, both an 80% and a 95% confidence interval, confidence interval in a normal and a keratoconic population. And this is what the current progression display looks, looks like. And let me go through each, each part of it. It will automatically display up to eight exams. The software will actually search for the first, in other words, you, let's say on this date, the first date here, for some reason you took 10 exams. It will search in order for the first one that meets quality, to, to meet quality uh, qualifications for the software. And it will display up to eight exams o over time. This is the, the first area here is the anterior radius of curvature. You'll see it's the A parameter. The second is the B parameter, which is the posterior. C is the corneal, minimal corneal thickness. And D will only appear if you enter visual acuity. Again, in, visual acuity, as I said, is not something the, the pentacam that determines. We then show you confidence intervals. The hashed line is an 80% confidence interval of a normal population. The solid one is the 95 of the normal. The hashed red is an 80% confidence, confidence interval of the keratoconic. And the solid red is 95. You can also click off where it says treatment here. And if you click off here, it will place a hatched, black and white hatch mark where you've treated the patient. Uh, in the future, the next release of this, these confidence intervals will actually not appear after the treatment because they really don't apply post post treatments. So if you look at this example, this is a patient who came in, this is back in May of 06, came in a month later, and you'll notice the anterior surface had a highly statistical significant change the po at, at a 95% confidence interval at both the normal and the keratoconic pop pop population. The back surface met at the 80% confidence, confidence interval for both normal and keratoconic. Corneal thickness met at 95, and again, the patient was then treated. The right side, the tabular, we list a number of parameters people have used in the past to follow progression, just in case you're doing a study. So we, we list again, this is the, the A parameter. This is the grading. That would be the, what basically you see in that graph. This is the actual radius of curvature. This is the B grading that you will see in that graph. This is the actual radius of curvature. Same thing on the C, minimal thickness. Distance visual acuity, again, only if you en enter it. We show you the final D from the bad display. And again, the progression index, ART max, K max, Q values, and a few anterior surface parameters here. So again, if you want to follow other things other than the graphical display, you have the ability to, to do that. And again, this is a blow up of what the tabular form, for, format is. So let's look at a couple of examples. So, the progression display has only been available for the, over the last year, but it allows you to retrospectively go back and look at old files that you have. So obviously, this is giving you an eight-year follow-up. The display wasn't available for eight years, but you can go back and notice over a period of eight years, we have a, I don't want to call it a gradual, but a continued progression of disease, both on the anterior surface, on the posterior surface, and also on the corneal th thickness. So again, if you were to follow this patient, you would, you would notice maybe no change between the first and the second, but it's really significant change by the third, third exam here. And had this been done now, that would have been very uh, indicative of someone who really needed treatment, in spite of the fact that if you notice, even in that third exam, the anterior surface was zero. In other words, they, they were asymptomatic. They had a normal anterior surface. However, it's showing a rapid change. So again, you can have a rapid change and you still have excellent vis visual acuity. So it really wasn't until this exam here, if you notice, 
that the anterior surface went from a zero to a one, and they probably became symptomatic here, even though with the progression display, we would have picked it up much earlier. And again, the goal should really be able to document progression before visual loss. Here is a 15-year-old, again, was advanced by the time they came in, but again, you'll notice gradual progression of disease throughout. Here is a relatively short-term one-year one follow-up. And again, if you notice down here, A0, B0, C0, all these, so this still looks like a normal eye, but if you notice the bads, this is not a normal eye. It's 2.92, 3.34, 3.47. So it's very early catacombs. The patient's completely asymptomatic. But notice the anterior surface here hasn't really changed much. Patient's completely asymptomatic, but notice what happened on the back surface. An 80% confidence interval here, and a 15-year-old, I probably would have treated that at an 80% on a 15-year-old, but notice by, by the third exam, well past a 95% confidence interval. So this is the perfect example of someone with subclinical disease. Subclinical means they have a, prom, they have a posterior change, but completely asymptomatic. And this is indicative of someone who probably warrants treatment to preserve vision, not waiting until you have changes on the anterior surface. Here is another interesting example, another 15-year-old early keratoconus. Here we're showing you both eyes at the same time. And this is just interesting because you notice going from the exam on 2015 to 2016 in the right eye, the anterior surface underwent statistically significant change, but the back surface was pretty much unchanged. And his other eye, the anterior surface wasn't highly changed, but notice the back surface shows statistically significant change. But again, both eyes here showed evidence of progression. This eye, however, remained asymptomatic, notice that AZ, A0, good visual acuity, but both eyes require treatment. This is uh, from a paper we published earlier this year on I think it was five or seven cases of well-documented unilateral keratoconus without any history of eye rubbing. Uh, and this again was published in the journal Cornea. And this is over a period of here, you can see four years, absolutely no change on the right eye, but notice the left eye, significant change. So this is the eye that had obviously keratoconic change. You can see here, pretty advanced keratoconus. If you look at the D values, here, the nine changing to 16, but this is a completely normal eye here. You can see the D values are, are less than one and actually didn't change at all. And this is also part of the article to show you the keratoconic eye here and the completely normal other eye. We published, I think, seven eyes with tomographic documented unilateral disease with an average follow-up of over five years. This is uh, the last example, and I think is probably the one that really highlights the value of the progression display the, the best. So this is a patient that came in, you can see here in November, this again, this is retrospectively analyzed, 11 of 2013. And if you look down here, A0, B0, C0, D0, but if you look at the bad display, it's a D of 2.51, so it's not a normal eye, but the patient was completely asymptomatic. And actually, this was an eye of highly asymmetric keratoconus. The other eye had pretty moderately advanced disease and was cross-cross-linked. Both the surgeon and the patient opted not to treat the right eye because the one is the patient was completely asymptomatic. Visual acuity was actually 2015 in this eye, you can see here A0, B0, C0, D0. The final D of 2.51 is only moderately abnormal. And both the patient and the surgeon said, well, we can observe the eye, partly because, again, they were asymptomatic. They had excellent visual acuity of 2015, and also because of the expense of treat treatment. So they decided, and they followed this patient in 2013, 2015, 2016, later in 2016, and then in 2017. 
And if you look here, the vision was 2015. Here, for one time, it went to 2022, but then back to 2020, 2020. And then the patient came in in 2017 saying, okay, now I, I actually notice a change in my vision. And they opted to treat in 2017. But the patient had, if you go back to here, a two-line loss of vision when they treated. We then went and retrospectively analyzed. And if you notice, from day one to this exam, they had statistically significant change on the anterior, the posterior, and at an 80% confidence interval on the corneal thickness. They had documented progression well before loss of vision. Had this been available to both the patient and the surgeon, the surgeon could have said, okay, I want to show you this. Notice, because they know they have keratoconus in the other eye that require treatment. You have keratoconus in this eye, and I can show you you're undergoing significant change. We should be intervening now before you have permanent loss of vision. This was not available. They waited until the patient actually came in and said, okay, now I've lost some vision. I can tell a difference. Let's get treated. Really, they should have been treated over here to preserve the vision. So again, the goal of all this is to let us document progression as early as possible and not have to wait till we have significant visual loss. So again, what's new in the diagnosis and progression? Again, it's a tomographic-based classification system that recognizes all the anatomical layers. And again, it's a tomographic-based progression display that documents statistically significant change. How do I determine progression? And, and just from a statistical point of view, it's determined by the, and again, it's really just the ABC, any single parameter greater at the 95% confidence interval or two parameters at at least the 80% confidence interval. And for those of you who do the math, two parameters at the 80% is effectively the same as one parameter at a 95% confidence interval. Whether you use a normal or keratoconic population database really is, is surgeon or physician uh, determining. That depends your risk and risk assessment and also the patients. Clearly, uh, the normal population is, is more appropriate for that younger early disease, and the keratoconic is more appropriate for the, the older, more established patient, but that really is something that you can choose with, with the patient. Also, it's very important when you take images, you really want to take all, and particularly for patients with keratoconus, you want to take your maps before anything else, before any drops are put in the eyes, and particularly before you dilate. Keratoconic eyes, particularly those that are more advanced, have a multifocal cornea. And if you dilate the pupil, they may actually be fixating in different points. So I always advise people to really do the maps before you do anything else in any other drops on the cornea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bellin. Um, so uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, so I'll just remind everybody that uh, you do have a questions box on your GoToWebinar panel. Uh, and then also for those of you that joined late or would like to review any of this presentation, we will email it to anybody that registered for this webinar. And you can always contact, contact us here at Oculus as well at sales at oculususa.com or you can contact us on our 1-800 number at 888-284-8004. Uh, for questions on webinars, you can also ask us general questions about the products, including the Pentacam. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Bellin, and I'll go ahead and get right to the questions. 